ask, out of respect for our speaker, to please remain seated until she is finished. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Lori T. Hello again. My name is Lori Temple, and I'm uh, an alcoholic. Um, so I don't have to tell you my sobriety date, because I already just... <laughs> Thank you for the birthday wish. Um, so uh, I've heard speakers that say, uh, start with something like when I was born, you know, and you just think, oh my God. Um, so I won't start there, but what I, uh, what I will start with is that um, I grew up with uh, parents who were in Scientology. And um, when I uh, was 12 and a half or so, they joined uh, what's called the Sea Org, which is um, a section of Scientology. If, if you were from Los Angeles, you probably have an idea of what that is. Um, and, and they sold everything that we had, and uh, we all moved. I had two younger brothers, and we all moved uh, to Los Angeles. And within the first day, we were separated from each other. And I didn't see uh, my mom or my stepdad for probably uh, months. I don't know how many months, months. And um, that's where I started uh, sort of figuring out how to be a grown-up. And one of the things that... Um, I learned there, we had jobs, everybody had a job, all children were treated like adults, and um, my job uh, was being a nanny, and so I was a nanny for uh, 12 one and a half year olds, and I got paid $17.20 a week. And I would take my $17.20, they provided housing and food, of course, I didn't have to survive only on that. I would ta I'd take my 1720 and I'd buy um, a few packs of cigarettes because that's an essential, absolutely. And then um, we would all go to Denny's and we would stay up all night. On our one day off during the week, we'd stay up all night and have hot fudge sundaes and drink coffee and whatever. I mean, we were like teenagers. And then I would go to the 7-Eleven and I would wait for some poor guy who probably was an alcoholic. I uh, referred to him as the wino, and I would wait for him, uh, give him money, and he would bring me uh, wine, and we would drink it in, by the dumpster behind the 7-Eleven. And I drank things like Mad Dog 2020 and other really classy uh, <laughs> beverages. Um, and the thing about Scientology, it's not uh, my experience, I'm suspecting, is not like um, celebrities like Tom Cruise or other, <laughs> other uh, John Travolta or something like that. My experience with Scientology was a lot about control and um, people that were drawn to Scientology in general were searching, especially the Sea Org part of it, which was a, we served uh, the people that took classes and stuff like that, and we lived there all, that was our life. And so there was a lot of abuse, and there were people there that uh, were also not healthy, and which is why my parents joined. I mean, they just sort of took care of us. Um, and there, if you, if you um, broke any rules or if you did something that they thought was... Um, not okay is the best way to say it. They'd put you on something called an e-meter and figure out, which is basically like a lie detector test, and um, figure out if you were telling the truth. And I learned very quickly, because I was not a saint, that I, I uh, figured out how to beat the test. I just sort of really relaxed, and I made friends with whoever the person was, and I figured out. And so there were just a couple times when... Um, one of them, I was innocent, but they, you know, that was probably busting me for all the other times that I wasn't. Um, but they did things like um, put you in isolation, or um, they s declare that you're a treason to the group and no one's allowed to speak to you. Um, you have to wear a sign, or they would, or some sort of um, color, and. 
there was a lot of shame and a lot of um, isolation. And I think what I learned there probably the most, Scientology did not make me an alcoholic. And I left there at 16, um, not w with anyone saying, have a good life. I left there in the middle of the night and found uh, some guy who would put me up and, you know. Um, but what I learned there was how to make sure that I could really fly under the radar. I really knew how to be invisible. I knew, I learned how to figure out what you wanted and then make sure that I did it. And that way, I did a pretty good job of um, not getting in trouble. And um, when I finally left there, I figured out, when I was there, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that went down that has no relevance, really, uh, in a setting like this. But I really, um, I really learned that I had only a couple assets. And one of them, uh, I, th I thought I was not very smart, but I realized that I sort of could get what I needed. And I did that once I got out of Scientology. I did that by trading. And uh, probably most women in this room know what I'm talking about when I'm saying trading. I never went without a place to sleep. I never went without a meal. And, um, and I did that uh, by using the only asset that I figured I had. I had an eighth grade education and I had a hard time finding jobs, so I would lie and make friends with the guy who was in charge. And, um, and so I did a lot of that. And when I finally came to Prescott um, uh, in 1981, and I was almost 19, and um, just like they tell you, moving to another city does not change anything. There were plenty of peeper, people here to manipulate and trade with and uh, drink with, and that's exactly what I did. Um, and I think, in general, like I was never arrested. I don't really have a very exciting story as far as, you know, all these crazy things that you hear people say. What, what I did was I drank a lot, and um, and I traded a lot, and I felt like shit a lot, and the shame didn't go away, and um, and I really got no other tools. Those were my tools, and. When I finally, um, I made friends with this woman who um, I went to therapy because I thought that therapy could fix me and uh, I got married and that did not change anything and um, the poor guy was not an alcoholic so it was quite an adventure, for, especially for him. Um, and then later he turned himself into a woman which was a really, <laughs> drastic move from my opinion. Um, but what I, I made friends with this woman who was in AA and I didn't know it. And um, she was in this therapy group and then we took a class and I saw her in my college class because I was gonna, I had to get a GED because I had an eighth grade education and I wanted to, um, I wanted to, you know, make something of myself. And, um, I wasn't really smart enough to, to be a professional hooker. I only was smart enough to, I never really made any money. I only just got meals and rent and uh, you know a ride here and there and maybe a trip to Las Vegas. Um, and so I was you know, determined to make something of myself. And so I got, went and got my GED and then um, I took a college class. My first husband was, um, a professor at Yavapai College and I took a class and I took his class because in case I failed, which I was sure I was gonna do, um, which I didn't, I got the highest grade in the class with no help from him, which helped me to realize that I wasn't just a complete idiot. And um, anyway, my friend was in AA and she and I and uh, another friend of hers, we hung out and did lots of stuff and they were both sober and I would hang out with them and then I'd go home and drink and um, and we did that for about a year we were really great friends um, I'm sure they knew I drank but I never drank around them 
And um, and then I went on a trip, and it didn't go very well at all. I went with another friend who drinks, drank a lot, and um, and I knew that they were in AA, and I knew that I had some kind of a problem. I knew I I didn't think I was an alcoholic, and that's a little drastic. I just wanted to stop drinking so much, and I wanted to maybe just stop, but I had no idea how to do it. And um, so I came back, and I went to a meeting at the suggestion. I said something like, I might have a problem. I don't know what I said. I said something, and they directed me to the Catholic Church. I think it was on a Wednesday night or Saturday or something. This was a while ago. And, um, and I went to the meeting, and I did not suddenly discover that I was an alcoholic. I just sat in the back and listened, and then some guy was hitting me up out of my, at my truck, and then I uh, met, my, I met uh, Mark at a restaurant, and um, we had dinner, and he was thrilled that I, you know, he was thrilled that I went to a meeting. And basically what happened was uh, about three months later, I, so I stopped drinking. And I went to a few meetings with my friends, and I, um, and about three months later, uh, Mark talked me into going on a date with him. And then, and then uh, we were really good friends, and I said, you know, I don't want to date you, because that'll screw everything up. And I really like having you for my friend. I really like you. And he said, let's just try it. Um, and so... And I always had the attitude of, what the hell? People would say, take this pill. I'd say, what the hell? Let's go here. OK. Get in the car. OK. Um, I never had really had a sense of watch out or be careful or, you know, I just, if it seemed like something that would be fun, then I did it. And so I went on a date with Mark. Um, and shortly thereafter, I mean, really, we were best friends. And um, then being sober helped a lot because then I was present and more aware of what was happening with him. And um, within three months, I was pregnant. And um, so we moved in together. It wasn't yours. <laughs> um, we moved in together, and I thought, first I just thought, you know, I don't want to raise a baby with a man. That was the first thing I decided. And then I just can do this on my own. I had done everything on my own. And, um, but I didn't want to raise a child the way with no parents, you know, or with only one parent, which is how I was raised. And um, so I thought, okay, so I, I, uh, I moved in. I was scared. I didn't want to get married again. I just thought I failed the first time and it's not going to go any better this time. Anyway, so we moved in together and he didn't have a sponsor and neither did I. And neither one of us was drinking. He had eight years sober. And, um, and we started on our adventure. And the adventure is not like where the, you think like uh, I'm dressed all in white and I'm riding off on some horse with this fabulous guy. It was, I mean, Mark is a fabulous guy, don't get me wrong, but uh, I was insane. <laughs> and I was pregnant and not drinking and no sponsor and no tools and moved in uh, and my, I just thought I, I just was insane. And he shortly thereafter went and got a sponsor. His sponsor had died and he didn't have one for a little while and he went and got another one and he started getting better and would not engage with me in the same way. And um, and I could see that, I could just see, like he just, he j it just was completely different. And so I thought, well, I better get a sponsor or I'm not going to be able to do this. So I went and found a sponsor. And um, she was amazing because she didn't ever tell me you have to believe in this or that or the other thing. You don't have to, she didn't say it has to be done this way. And she started taking me through the book. And I started, uh, I was going to a women's meeting on Monday nights. And um, we get to step two where there's this whole thing about God. And um, I was not about God at all. Scientology is about 
teaching you that anything that happens to you, good or bad, is something that I caused. And so if I'm the cause of everything in my life, there's no room for God. And she didn't say you have to believe in God to be sober. She didn't say um, I'm not going to work with you or any of that. She just said go to the meeting and come back here every Tuesday night. And so, uh, or whenever it was, I think it was a Tuesday. Anyway, so I would go to the meeting, and every time uh, it was a ticket meeting, and I got a service commitment so that I wouldn't have to talk to anyone. I made the coffee so that I could stay busy before the meeting. I want, you know, I could just be in there, but I didn't really want to be connected. And um, every time my ticket got called, it seemed like it was about step two. Whatever, it was a 12, uh, 12 and 12, and, um, and I'd just pretend I didn't have a ticket. I just, you know, I just didn't say anything. And one day I said something to her about that, and she said, just tell them your name and tell them the truth. I said, they're, they don't want to hear the truth from me. I don't think there is a God, and I definitely don't believe in it. She said, tell the truth. And um, she didn't say anything stupid like, the truth will set you free because I wouldn't have been able to hear her. She just said, go in and tell what's real for you. And so the next time my ticket got called, of course it was on step two, and I said, uh, my name's Lori and I'm an alcoholic and I don't believe in God. And I just waited because I knew someone's going to come up and escort me out or they're going to get me in the parking lot after. Um, something's going to happen. And... Um, and nothing happened. And I got busy, you know, cleaning up the coffee, and a lady came up to me and said, um, I so appreciate you telling your truth and having the courage to come in here and share that with us. And so, of course, the next Tuesday I went and told my sponsor, and she was, you know, thrilled. They're always thrilled about shit. And <laughs> she, so she, I said, well, I still, I still don't believe it. I'm not connected. I'm not, you know, I don't. I don't feel like what's on the inside for me looks the same as what's on the outside for all of them. And she just told me to keep coming every week. And we worked through the steps and we worked, did the four step. And um, she said, it's going to change for you. You'll have an experience. And one of the things that she had me do to try to connect was, you know, stop trying to figure out what God is. She said, if you can think of characteristics that, um, that make you feel safe, which I felt unsafe all the time. She said, that make you feel safe, uh, make a list of those and that's your God. And so that's what I did, kindness and love and someone who loves me no matter what the hell I do and um, that's always there and just things like that, which I don't know a single human that's like that. I know a lot of, a lot of them that have a lot of that, but not all of it. And... Um, so one day, uh, so in the meantime, I had a baby, and he's growing up, and we're staying married, and doing the best we can to keep from, you know, being crazy. Uh, I won't speak for Mark, of course, but I, <laughs> I'm crazy. And um, so I got the chance to stay home with him, which was a huge blessing. And we were home one day, and he's, I think, two and a half or three, and pissed off about something. His hands were clenched, and his face was red. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to be a good mom because I didn't want to be a mom in the first place because I'm only going to be able to pass on what I've been given. And I wasn't given anything, any tool that was worth passing on. And so I was petrified about being a mom. And, um, and he, so I have this little timeout chair, which I, he never sat in. And... So I said, you need, to sit in, you need to sit in the timeout chair. And he's just like not having it. He's pissed. And I'm mad. And I'm standing there thinking about how I'm going to get him in the chair. And then he's, you know, it, being defiant, whatever. And I knew that in that moment I was going to hit him. And it's exactly what I didn't want to do. And so I ran in the bathroom and I shut the door. And I'm just sitting on the floor in the bathroom crying. And he's sitting on the floor in the hallway crying. And I asked for help. And uh, 
I don't know what I asked. It doesn't matter because um, in that moment, I was able to open the door and I didn't hit him. And he turned 25 in July and I have never hit him. And the only reason for that is because of this program. Um, there have been lots of experiences that I've had where um, I've been able to be of service. I've had sponsees, I've done book studies and all this kind of stuff where I try to stay involved. And I've watched uh, the miracle of this program work in other people's lives all the time. It's not as easy to see it in my own life because, you know, I'm all stuck in my head and I think only, mostly about myself and, you know, the perspective is way off sometimes. Um, when I went and told my sponsor about that experience, uh, of course, you know, then she's thrilled again. And I was just like, you know, oh shit, that means now there's something. I've admitted, I've admitted there's something. And, uh, and once I did that, things changed because I could start to see it and I could start to feel it. And for me, I don't, um, she never did stuff like make me get on my knees and say prayers because I just told her I'm not doing that. And she, uh, when I got to, you know, different, I did the stuff that mattered. This is what she told me anyway. I did the stuff that mattered. I did my four step, which she conveniently, I mean, which I conveniently uh, left my mother off of there. She goes, what about your mom? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm over that. That's no big deal. Um, what about Scientology? I'm like, well, I, I just had this way, my whole life was compartmentalized. Well, Scientology is in the Scientology box, which doesn't get opened, so I'm cool. And um, what about the guy, you know, that abused you? Oh, yeah. Well, and so she started really helping me to open those boxes without being dramatic or whatever. She just, she just started uh, getting me to open them. I don't know how she did it. She was amazing. Kind and loving is how she did it because that wasn't something that I was used to when someone was trying to get something out of me. Um, so I finished the steps. It took me nine months to finish my four step, but it really only took me two weeks to do it. And um, procrastination is on the defects list every time. Um, and in the meantime, we had, uh, we had a business. Mark, and Mark, Mark was a contractor and we had, I helped him run the business. Then we had another baby. Um, and when he was born, he ended up in the ICU uh, in Flagstaff. And um, he was four pounds. And I just, I mean, you know, and I was 40. So I'm just thinking, it's my fault. I should have had a baby at 40, on and on, you know how. You know how we do. Um, he's now 6'1", and uh, could easily take me to the floor, even though I used to be able to beat him up, even though I didn't really do that. We'd, he would come in and say, try and wrestle me to the floor, Mom. And then, you know, I'd take his legs out and get him to the floor, and <laughs> he was always mad about that. Um, I've had a lot of experiences in sobriety. We've, we went through bankruptcy. Um, I guess I was about 10 or 12 years sober when we did that, maybe a few more. We lost everything. Um, and the idea that, um, I mean, you're not, this, first of all, you're not supposed to lose everything once you're sober, right? That happens before you get here. And it's not something you're supposed to have to walk through once you're here because you're supposed to do it right. And um, so we walked through sobriety, I mean, we walked through bankruptcy. And um, we moved, when we moved, um, Mark uh, really struggled. I got a job right away. I used to be a dental assistant, and so I just applied and got hired. And um, But Mark had a hard time getting a job. And 
almost every day he would tell me that he wanted to kill himself. And, um, and I really worked hard on trying to make sure that was not going to happen because that was not a part of this plan. And I kept really quiet about it. I didn't talk to my sponsor about it. Um, and one day, uh, we were doing this book study. There were four of us women. And, um, you know, and then I, well, I had to go get a regular job. Like, I had worked for Mark for all this time. Like, that's a posh job. I had to go work for a real person. They make you show up on time. They, they make you do stuff. It's just, it was such a drag. <laughs> and um, my sponsor really helped me to focus on how to stay grateful, how to be, I mean, we, I had a job, thank God, you know. Anyway, we went to this book study, and I... Um, I just couldn't, I was just really struggling, and I told her that Mark wanted to kill himself. And she just immediately said, you need to go home and tell him that he needs to get connected to the men in the program, that you cannot save him. And, um, and I really wanted to save him. I, I just didn't, I just didn't want him, I just would come home in fear every day that I would find him. Um, and so I wanted to save him from that. But I couldn't, I knew I couldn't save him from whatever was happening. And he got connected to the, to the guy. And I, when I came home, I was petrified. Like, well, if I tell him that I'm not going to listen anymore, then he's going to kill himself, and then I'll be responsible for that. Um, but that's not what happened, obviously. Um, he got help from the guys in, in AA. And, um, and I got help from the women in AA. And life kept going. And, you know, he got a job working $10 an hour, and which is just like, you know, he was a contractor. He was really struggled with that. And then God had this plan for us. We just kept trying to ask for direction. Um, my sponsor taught me that when I go to leave the house in the morning, that when my hand touches the doorknob, I ask God to direct my thinking. And I did that every day. I still do that. And um, so he got a job working for a treatment center driving a van. And he came home one day. Uh, and they made him a therapist after a while, uh, classic for treatment. And, um, and they, he came home one day and he said, I think, I think uh, we should open a halfway house. And I just looked at him like, have you lost your mind? No, no, we don't, we know nothing about a halfway. We know nothing about this. How are we going to even, how, no. And Mark's always coming home with ideas. You know, that's a, sort of the, and I, I usually, I try really hard not to freak out. Um, usually he wants a new truck, but <laughs> this time he wanted, this time he wanted a halfway house. And what he found, what he said is that he's working at the treatment center and he sees that the people leave after 30 days and they get drunk or high. There's no place for them to be safe and to learn about AA, to be able to have support. And um, so I said, okay, well, you find out. We had no money. Right? I mean, I said, oh, you find out about it and then, you know, let's talk about it. Okay, well, so that was just like saying yes. And it didn't take long, and we, and uh, he got a loan from a friend. We got a loan from a friend, and we opened a halfway house. And um, we treated him like family, and uh, we taught him about how to do stuff. They didn't know how to do anything. They didn't know how to, they didn't have a bank account, or I mean, they just started drinking and using young, you know. And we'd have barbecues, and we'd do. Uh, we had we had community, and then uh, before t before very long after that, he got connected with um, a guy in the community who had a treatment center but no clients, and we had 35 clients, and um, so we got together and we started a treatment center, and um, for me, it was one of the best things that's happened to me because I got the chance. I got the chance to help people. I got the chance to give back. I got the chance to teach people about AA, which um, somebody told Mark, you know, AA and treatment are different, and that's true. Um, 
but the part that I got to do was teach them about AA. And, and then we also got to help, um, I think we had uh, six women that came in. We had a men's program, and then one day a guy showed up with his girlfriend, and he wasn't coming in without his girlfriend, so we started a women's program. <laughs> and, and so then we, had, then, then we had women, and then before long uh, we had um, pregnant women that showed up at the door, heroin addicts that had nowhere to go. And so uh, we took them. And over the time that we ran uh, the treatment center, 30% of our clients were, were scholarshiped because people that don't have money need help too. And it was a really awesome experience. Over, so uh, I think we had six babies over the time, over that six years. I mean, I say we because, you know, there are, there are children. We're the, grand, we're the grandparents. Um, and those moms, those babies, I see them on Facebook and I see them on Instagram. And they're like in first grade, some of them. They're going to kindergarten. They're, their parents are married and have a life. They own homes. It's just like totally awesome. And I get to be a part of that as long as I stay God-directed. Um, and what happened was that there came a time when uh, we lost our purpose. And as treatment is, um, lots of uh, treatment centers make a lot of money. And um, what happened for us is that we got big and we got distracted. And, um, and we lost our purpose. And we weren't God-driven anymore. Um, and so God had us do something else. And it took me probably a year to get over it um, because that was really hard. Not having an understanding that my primary purpose has to be um, sobriety and my primary purpose has to be helping other alcoholics. And then the rest of my life fills in. I don't have a life without uh, having a primary purpose of sobriety. And... Um, so, I mean, I still have an amazing life, and I'm grateful to be out of treatment um, because I get to do other things like spend time with my kids, and I have a 17-year-old and a 25-year-old, and, um, and we have some vacation rentals that we run, which is a lot of fun, and I get to go to AA, and I get to be a part of the miracle that saved my life. And... Um, I think one of the things, I don't know if anyone has children or 17-year-olds, but uh, they really don't like their parents a whole lot, even if you're sober. And, um, I mean, he likes me. It, you know, he doesn't say, I hate you or anything like that. But he doesn't talk to me a whole lot. And, uh, you know, if I come in and say, how's it going? He's like, good. Can you shut the door on your way out? Um, and so... The other day, and I just, I have a sponsor that reminds me that that's part of, that's part of this. Um, I wouldn't be a good mom if I didn't work a program. I would not be a good mom if I didn't have a sponsor. And I get the chance to be a good mom, which is something that I didn't get. Um, so the other day, he well, was about a month ago, he comes in my room, I'm putting on my shoes, and I got a long list of stuff that I'm planning on doing that day, you know, and... Uh, he's doing school from home and all, all that stuff that's happening. And um, he comes in and, and he just throws himself. He's six one. he throws himself on the bed and he's laying there and I'm thinking he wants money or food or a ride. But he has a car, so he, you know. But I said, oh, well, what's, what's happening? And then he just starts talking. And um, probably about a month before that, I went in and I made an amends to him for all the times that I wasn't there when we were running treatment, for all the times that he got up in the night and I was out dealing with some crazy nut on the roof uh, or somebody who'd gotten high. I made amends for uh, working too much. 
And I let him, I explained why I felt I owed the amends. And, um, you know, he's 17, so he's kind of uncomfortable, just uncomfortable that I was talking to him, I suspect. But also, you know, you're we talking about something besides food or money. <laughs> um, but I really needed to do it. I really needed to make the amends. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, Mom, um, I, never, I never realized that we didn't have a lot of money and I never realized really that you weren't around. When I needed you, you were here. And my perception was that when he needed me, I was nowhere. I was at work. I was dealing with people from treatment. And so that it was short and, you know, simple. Um, and so then a month later, or two months later, I guess it was, he came and flopped himself on the bed, and he just started talking to me and about AA. And he said, um, he, and, and about himself. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, I have this girlfriend in Australia. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, the whole time that I've been a mom in this program, my kids haven't seen me drink. They were born into sobriety. Uh, I don't yell, and I learned how to do that here. I don't freak out. Um, secretly on the inside, if I don't hear from the 25-year-old after a few days, I start to think he's been murdered in San Francisco. Um, then I call my sponsor, I talk to Mark, you know. but. My 17-year-old sat there and talked to me for an hour and a half. I mean, that's just like um, unbelievable. It's a gift that I may never get again. And I get that gift because I show up in here, because I ask for help, because I um, am of service, because I call my sponsor when I really want to say uh, he's ignoring me or he has this sharp tone or he's being an ass. I don't tell him that. I call my sponsor. Um, or I go outside and I water the plants or I do something else. I really have learned how not to react. And, um, and it's the same in marriage. There's no way that I would be married for 25 years to the same person, <laughs> never cheated, never separated, never ran away. There's no way I could do that without this program. There's no way. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have had every day was full of bliss. It means that when shit hit the fan, we know what to do. We have tools. We have people that we can call. We have uh, steps that we can work. And it doesn't mean that I wasn't in his business or telling him what to do, and it doesn't mean that he didn't do the same. But it means that we know how to separate and start again. We know how to ask for help and start again. And um, I mean, I'm lucky that I get to marry, I got to marry my best friend. I, n I never had a best friend, first of all. But then it works, in this marriage it works, because when I'm freaking out and I think that he's being whatever he, he says, I'm your friend. And he says, uh, I wouldn't hurt you on purpose. And I'm not going to do anything that's going to make your life unhappy. And I've learned how to trust that. And I've learned how to be the same for him. And there's no way I could do that without AA. There's no way. I don't know how, I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know how to do anything except trade my body for what I needed and, uh, and scam. That's all I knew how to do when I got here, really. I mean, I knew how I got a job, and I knew how to do all that, but I, I didn't know how to be a person. I didn't know how to be in a relationship, and I definitely didn't know how to be a mom, and I didn't know how to let people love me. Um, and there's no way I can pay that back. I get the chance to come in here and speak, and I got asked, uh, and I just, you know, LaVon over there gave my phone number out, which I try to keep it a secret. Um, and then when they asked me and I hung up the phone, I'm like, shit, I don't, wanna, I don't want to. I'm petrified of people. <laughs> so 
But I got told, show up, because there's somebody in this room that, that needs to hear whatever it is that I'm trying to say, that needs to hear my experience. And um, I'm super grateful that I get to be uh, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and that I get to work the steps and that it changes my life. That's the beauty. Like, doing the work changes my life. And I've done it a bunch. And every time I get in trouble, I do the work. And then I get to change. And um, my life has just been one adventure after another, sober. And uh, I'm very grateful. And I'm grateful to be here. Thanks.